Welcome to the ninth lecture of Advanced Dynamics 4428, Rigid Body Kinematics. We've finished our discussion of analytical uh, dynamics. Um, I'm sure everybody's glad about that. Um, we've, we, there's much more really to talk about there, especially with regard to virtual power techniques. Jordan and Kane methods, they're called, um, that, that form the, the basis of modern analysis technology. Um, and the basis of um, a lot of uh, computing techniques that have been developed in the past 20 years. But for the remainder of um, this particular course, we'll talk about the behavior of rigid body structures not permitted to shear stretch, which is really a simplification of reality because uh, every structure has some sort of uh, shearing and stretching phenomenon. And uh, a lot of times when we're interested in these kinds of things, we, we're worried about that. Um, and that's thereby, that's the interest of uh, vibrations, say. But what you can do is you can talk about having rigid bodies and then combine this kind of motion with vibrations of those same bodies together in the linear superposition and then obtain um, overall motion uh, with the vibration. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about rigid body properties, the inertia tensor, um, rigid body kinematics, how to describe the motion, and rigid body dynamics, how do they react to forces, how to describe the motion, and then what's called the inertia tensor. All right. Today we're going to use kinematics to preview a few things about the properties of rigid bodies. And there is an entire chapter on this particular topic, uh, chapter 6, in your text. Okay, so what we're going to do is to talk about the, the motion of rigid bodies. And a rigid body is one in which that uh, does not bend or deflect. Sounds fairly obvious, you know, given the fact it's called a rigid body. But um, then there's more to it than that. Every point of the body remains in the same place in relation to every other point of the body. And we can use that to simplify the representation of what's going on with rich bodies in terms of equations a lot. You might say a rigid body can be considered a collection of many small masses connected rigidly uh, together. So we can use this idea to determine the body's behavior and properties. So this is our like a potato shape. Um, we have our x, y, z coordinate system. And the idea is, is that each of these little bodies here that are drawn in, um, uh, when you put them all together in a rigid matrix of uh, a collection here, you've got your total rigid body all together. So it, let's name one of these tiny masses as mi or point p. Also, we can uh, define a coordinate system O, X, Y, Z that is attached to the rigid body. Notice that this is lowercase rigid uh, coordinate system. Then we could say that we have cap O, cap X, cap Y, cap Z, all right? And that's going to be, treat that as inertial. And then we might have this potato-shaped body um, with point P is represented by M sub I, all right? And that's one of the many masses that make up this body that are all attached up together. And this this coordinate system that's attached to the rigid body um, might tell us that the system is rotating and translating. Um, the rotation and so forth is described by omega CS, while the translation, well, is described in part by cap R and um, the rest by rho, right? Really, all of the translation is described by capital R with regard to the, um, the origin of our moving coordinate system that's attached to this rigid body. Uh, as shown. Okay. R is k equal to cap R plus, plus rho. If you look back in uh, lecture two, that's, you know, it's just same as back then. R dot then is equal to cap R dot plus rho dot. And really, um, if we want to use a relative coordinate system definition, then we could do that as well. We have this um, the split due to the rotation of the coordinate system and then motion of the particle with respect to, say, a fixed coordinate system attached to the moving bottom. You might think about what this value turns out to be. What do you think it's going to be? It turns out to be zero, isn't it? Because every point remains fixed with regard to every other point in the system. The only thing that can change here is rotation. If we include the mass center and then another point, okay, and the mass center will say that's C, and then another point B that the rigid body is moving about, we need to redraw the figure slightly. In here, we're going to assume that, in contrast to, say, the earlier lectures that we had in this semester, that B is not moving. All right, so this busy 
picture here. This is our original coordinate system that's fixed, O, X, Y, Z, all capital letters. We have a center of mass here, okay, with, and given by C. And then we have these variety of vectors from our coordinate system um, attached to the moving, moving body. There's Z, there's X, there's lowercase o, uh, Z here. There's Y coming out this Y way. And then we have our point uh, P with mass MI. And this is, here's our row sub I. And then we have point B outside that's external that we don't know what it's doing. Okay, so, and then as well we have Omega CS that tells us how the, the system is rotating. Alrighty, so now if we say that the sum of all these masses is equal to capital M, just like we had before, and then the center of mass is given by the sum of each mass times its distance r sub i, okay, divided by the total mass, that gives us our r sub c, the center of mass location as a vector. The linear momentum of the ridge body then is, is cap P, say, and that's capital M times the velocity of the center of mass, or R sub C with the dot. All right, and in other words, if you look at this, this equation, then it's actually M sub I, R sub I dot, uh, summed from 1 to N, where cap N is the number of masses that make up uh, this entire ridge body. The angular momentum of the ridge body about, say, B is the moment arm cross product with the, the linear momentum and our moment arm here is B sub I right from B to each of these masses. About C well it's a similar sort of situation the moment arm is C sub I let's go back to the picture it's actually from the center of mass out here to our mass C there's our moment arm okay and so H sub C is equal to C sub I Crossed with m sub i v sub i, or and as you know, this is r sub i dot. And it turns out we can actually relate h sub b back with h sub c. r sub i is equal to r sub c plus c sub i. Let's go back to the picture here. r sub i, so that goes from the origin here out to m sub i. If we go through the center of mass, then it's r sub c plus c sub i. So that's that part. R sub i dot is equal to B sub i is R sub c dot plus C sub i dot. And then C sub i dot really is going to be equal to zero because that's actually the vector from one point on this rigid body to another point on the rigid body. The length of that vector isn't going to be changing, is it? So all we have to worry about is its rotation. So omega sub c s cross C sub i, where omega sub c s is related back to the rotation of the vector. It's not going to be changing in length at all, right? So then h sub c is equal to z sub i cross m sub i v sub c plus c sub i cross m sub i times the quantity omega sub c s cross c sub i. And all we've done here is we've just substituted in for v sub i. Right here, there's our v sub i, there's a v sub i, r sub c dot, c sub i dot, and c sub i dot, right? So we've substituted in here, just as we've shown, where this is r sub c dot from here. Okay, so then this first term is, we've taken m sub i, put it in front, and that's m sub i, c sub i cross v sub c, where i goes from 1 to a cap n for all of our different masses, and then We've got in the second term c sub i cross m sub i uh, um, times of the quantity omega sub c s cross c sub i. The first term is zero to the center of mass definition, right? I mean, if it's um, this is going to be m sub i r sub i dot, okay, is n i is equal to one cross r sub c dot. And that's going to turn out to be zero. You can check it and see for yourself. And then what we end up with then is this equation to tell us what the angular momentum of the ridge body about its center of mass is going to be. It's only tied back to rotation. If 
if we rewrite this, rewrite this equation uh, one slightly, we have h sub b is actually equal to um, b sub i across m sub i r sub c, r sub i dot, right? Um, and if we, instead of going straight from point b, straight over here to, say, point m sub i, and instead we go through the center of mass, point c, and then go out here from c to the mass uh, point P up here, and if you go back to the figure you can see what I'm talking about. And go from B to C, well we call that B sub C unfortunately, and this vector here, that was C sub I, and this vector here, well that was B sub I, and so B sub I is really B sub C plus C sub I, just as we've written here, and we can regroup that cross product, we have B sub C crossed M sub I R sub I dot, or M sub I V sub I, this is R sub I dot, plus then, if you notice, we got c sub i across m sub i r sub i dot. That's actually h sub c. Oh, originally that was h sub b. So the angular momentum about an external point b, as long as that point isn't moving, is the same as the angular momentum about the center of mass, plus the linear momentum about the linear momentum of the entire system um, crossed with this vector from b to C, right? So this is a moment arm from B to C. Not so bad to try to figure out. In other words, the angular momentum about B, well that's actually the angular momentum about C, plus the angular momentum of rigid body turning about its mass center. Not so bad to figure out. Okay. Suppose we put, and this is a figure that kind of illustrates that fact, h sub c, h sub c is parallel to omega sub c s, it should say here properly, and maybe we have linear motion of, on an object, we have an external point b, okay, and then so h sub b is actually h sub c, h sub c plus b sub c cross p, right, and this Turns out this b sub, c, b sub c cross p is related back to the linear motion about b of this object. So as b is fixed and this thing is moving linearly, well that represents some angular momentum, but then also this thing is rotating about omega sub c s, so we add the two together to get our total angular momentum. Suppose we put b at the origin of our of our coordinate system that happens to be attached to the body and fix it so it's not moving. So in other words, that the ridge body isn't moving except to rotate about that this point O. And let's look and see what happens. This R sub I dot then is equal to cap R dot, which is going to be go out to be zero. And then we have omega sub C S cross rho sub I, and then rho sub I dot relative to that moving coordinate system, well that's going to be equal to zero as well because it's a it's a rigid body, isn't it? All we have to worry about really is the rotation about our small point O of our, of our moving of our coordinate system that happens to be attached. So this is O, X, Y, Z. All we have to worry about is the rotation about the origin here of our case O. Or in other words, we're the same thing as B because they're in the same location. Okay, then this h, the angular momentum about that same O is actually equal to mi r i, okay, the linear momentum, crossed with omega sub c s crossed r sub i, and where this is um, related back to the velocity of point i. So the body is turning along omega sub c s about O, but O might not be the center of mass. But the, in any case, this still will give us what the angular momentum of that point is, as long as the point is attached to the rigid body. Okay. Here, though, the O is fixed or inertial by assumption. Okay. Something you want to remember here at this particular point is the triple product rule for uh, from vector calculus for for cross products. If we have A cross B cross C, where each A, B, and C are vectors then we can say that this is equal to a dot c along b minus b dot a along c. All right. 
So in this equation, we'll say that A is MIRI dot, so this is our A. B is omega sub CS, all right? And then C is R sub I, there's our C, isn't it? So our H sub naught is equal to then, all right, we've got MIRI is A, omega C S is B, and C is R I. So this is our A, and then our, here R sub I is our C, along B. That's not a cross product, that should be just along B. Okay, A dot C along B. And then the second part of it is B dot A along C, isn't it? Okay, so in that situation then, what we've got finally is, is this R, R sub I dot R sub I, so that's R sub I squared, isn't it, along omega sub CS, and then this is omega sub CS dot M sub I R sub I along R sub I. This first part is a portion of angular momentum if, if our vector R sub I to that particular mass M sub I and then this omega sub c s were really perpendicular to each other. So that would be like the, the maximum possible maximum possible angular momentum that you could possibly have. But then see, this r sub i and omega sub c s might not be actually parallel to each other. So if we draw r sub i, say from our point lowercase o, and this is x, this is y, and that's z, say, and then maybe this is rotating about omega sub c s, right, that's for our coordinate system, then we go out here to point p, which is actually with the mass m sub i, and you look at it, these aren't perpendicular to each other, and so our angular momentum is actually going to be a little bit less than that, and the, re the correction will be given by here, that's our correction. This is what it would be if it's maximum possible if these two were perpendicular. But since they're not, then we actually have to have this correction in here. Omega sub C S dot R sub I along R sub I. Now if we say that H sub naught is defined as H naught X E sub lowercase x, H naught Y E sub Y, H sub naught Z E sub Z. This is along the coordinate system attached. attached to the body, and then we do the same sort of thing for omega sub c s and r sub i, right, and these are all again attached to the body, then we can write out some things in terms of almost like a matrix form, isn't it? We could we could write it out what that the angular momentum is going to be, that's m sub i times, and then this first term actually ends up being r sub i squared omega sub x e sub x plus omega sub y e sub y plus omega sub z e sub z, and then we have this dot product among amongst omega and r along the r direction for the correction term. And if you expand that out, it's actually h not um, h not x along the x direction is this term rather long. This is the total part, and then these there's the corrections. H not y, there's the total part, and here's your correction, total part, correction for z. A lot of symmetry, really. If you look here, we have x, x, y, y, z, z, and whatever it is x, x, and then we subtract off x, i, x squared, and then for y, it's y, i, y, we subtract that part off, and z, we subtract off z, i, z squared, and then for the other terms, it's i, y, i, x, i, z, i, x, i, x, i, y, i, z, i, y, so on and so forth. Notice the symmetry. Suppose we can define the moments of inertia. We can call these moments of inertia things. And this is actually, notice how we've rewritten it in terms of omega x, omega y, and omega z. And we could actually write this all out as just one big uh, set of matrix multiplications. But suppose, for example, we say that i naught sub x x is m sub i r sub i um, squared minus r sub i x squared. All right, and so that's this part. 
and then R, I not I O sub Y Y, well that's this part, and then the Z one is this one. Those are the moments of inertia. But what are these over here on the right hand side? Those are products of inertia. And we call those I naught X Y, I naught X Z, I naught Y Z. And you can actually prove that I naught X Y is equal to I naught Y X and so on. Um, they have to be. Notice the minus signs. Okay? So if you substitute those into the equation, then they just simplify things, but it's really only they just trade complexity in one place for another. Um, and then we get the symmetry, interesting symmetry here, here, and here. These are both equal to each other, as are these two terms, and these two terms as well. You can use matrix notation, it actually makes things look a lot nicer. Um, and we did H naught as a matrix, and so this is really H naught X, along E sub X, E sub Y, E sub Z. One thing to always remember now is that when you're writing matrix notation, what you're presuming, you're always always assuming a coordinate system. Okay. In these situations. And here we're treating it as E sub lowercase x, E sub lowercase y, E sub lowercase z. Turns out here that for uh, a two uh, I, how should I put it, uh, a matrix that has the rows and columns. We have to assume two coordinate systems. We have we have E sub X, E sub Y, E sub Z along this direction. We also have E sub X, E sub Y, and E sub Z along this direction. And you can assume you can use different coordinate systems, and we'd have to change what's written in these boxes to reflect the fact that we're using different coordinate systems. This is the reason for the difference here is that this actually has only columns on it, doesn't it? It's uh, one column, but uh, three rows. So we have several rows, but only one column. This may have three rows and three columns. That's the reason we need two coordinate systems for this one and only one for this one, and indeed one for omega. If we wrote this in full tensor notation, which would be the proper way to try to do this, we would not have to assume any coordinate systems. Remember with vectors, vectors are first order tensors, and with vectors we don't have to have any coordinate system up until the very last minute. Um, and in fact, full tensors you can write um, this inertia tensor, okay, and this is representation. Um, this, if you have this inertia tensor and then treat it as a, with a pair of a pair of coordinate systems, that gives us this matrix layout. In other words, the matrix notation is the tensor notation plus a coordinate system or two. Okay, depends on the order of this thing. Um, this is called the inner product, this funny looking uh, cross product thing. If you've been through any, any tensor calculus and you know what I mean. H naught is equal to I dot omega. And that would give us this representation for um, H naught if we have the coordinate system chosen. H naught is the total angular momentum when O is an inertial point or O is the center of mass C. For a real rigid body, we'd have to shrink the individual masses m sub i to an infinitesimally small size. And so then n would go to infinity, and we'd have to replace the sums with integrations. And we could do that. We'd have the following here. We'd have i naught xx is equal to triple integral of the density, and so like the infinitesimal masses here, um, times the quantity y squared plus z squared dx dy dz. And I'll show how it's related back to the original definitions. I not yy and I not zz is a similar sort of deal, and we'd have our products of inertia, and the minus signs are missing here. Sorry. All right. So we can do the ex an example here and say we look for the right have a right circular cylinder radius r height h, uniform density rho, and then we can find the inertia tensor about the given coordinate system here, where this given coordinate system o x y z. And it's actually h over 2. It's sitting right at the center of the cylinder. 
And the way we go about it is, is we can do this with an integration since it's a continuous body and presume it's homogeneous. That's after all because it's got a uniform density. Then do triple integral of rho times quantity y squared plus z squared dx dy dz. That's just straight from the definition. And if you do that integral um, and end up working it out, it's uh, not all that much fun to do these integrals and it requires that you remember how to do um, fairly early on calc. And um, we'd end up with, for example, um, rho h pi r to the fourth power divided by four and i naught xx is equal to one twelfth m um, times the quantity three cap r squared plus h squared and then we could go and look at about these off diagonal terms i naught xy it turns out that i naught xy and i naught yx are both equal to zero as are i naught xz and i naught zx and the inertia matrix is then has only the inertia um, products of inertia on it the, all of the uh, the moments of inertia I should say the products of inertia are all equal to zero that's because of the choice of the coordinate system not because of the particular nature of the body although it does help all right if you're probably familiar with the parallel axis theorem but you may not be familiar with this form of it that's a, a parallel axis theorem is pretty handy to find inertia matrix components for a new coordinate system translated, not rotated, but translated only from the original. So if we say have um, an original coordinate system given by the A and then a new coordinate system given by the B, so we go from X, Y, Z to X prime, Y prime, Z prime. Again, we go from this original to the new one. Remember which way you go because it does make a difference. We go from this one to the other one and we, def we actually go from A, we go um, minus a along the x direction or x prime direction. Notice that the axes are parallel to each other. We go over here b along the negative y direction and we go c along the negative z direction. Okay, so x prime is equal to x plus a, y prime is equal to y plus b, and z prime is equal to z plus c. If we define xc, yc, zc from the center of mass to the origin of the A coordinate system, okay, the A coordinate system, its origin might not be consistent with this, uh, coincident with the center of mass, and this is the particular point that actually is probably quite a bit different than what you're used to seeing, okay. Then we can go back and look at what the definition of our, our moments and products of inertia are. And in fact, I A sub X X really, well, if we treat it as just the, and rather than use an integral form, if we use the sum of masses form, it's M sub I times quantity R sub I Y squared plus R sub I Z squared, from, uh, where I is from one to it cap in. And then if we substitute in uh, for the new coordinate system, I B sub X prime X prime, then what we end up with is instead of, of uh, the original definition, uh, we'd end up with m sub i. We'd end up with m sub i times the quantity um, y sub i plus b quantity squared plus z sub i plus c quantity squared, and you can expand that out. And actually, we end up with y i squared, z i squared, and we have b squared and c squared in here. You might be expecting those four terms from the parallel axis theorem, but what about these terms? They actually turn out to be important as well. And indeed, from this, we end up with the original definition I A sub X X. And then we have the mass of the body, the overall mass of the body times B squared plus C squared. This is from the parallel axis theorem. But we also end up with these two terms. And where these appear is that if the original A coordinate system, the original A coordinate system, if that coordinate system is not aligned with the center of mass, then these terms will appear. And if you say that m sub yc and do all the same thing again, then we end up with a similar sort of situation. Um, for products of inertia, we end up with the familiar change for i sub b x prime y prime is equal to i sub a x y minus m a b. Okay, and then we have then this extra correction for when if the a coordinate system is not aligned with the center mass of the original body. So if we do this for the entire set of components, we end up with I prime sub B is equal to I prime sub A plus
plus is m times the b squared plus c squared, a squared plus c squared, a squared plus b squared down the diagonal, minus ab, minus ac, minus bc on the off diagonals. And then we have the center matrix here, and where xc, yc, zc, these are all the distance between the a coordinate system's center of its origin and the actual center of mass. The same idea works with integrations as shown here. Okay, and so we end up with exactly the same, same situation. Now again, if A is at the center of mass, then X, C, Y, C, and Z, Z, C are equal to zero, and so we get to what you might be used to seeing, okay? The parallel axis theorem for translation from the center of mass only. This is only from the center of mass. If you start out from some other place, then you can't use that. And here's an example of this. Surface rotating about its point, a uh, sphere I should say, rotating about a point in the, on its surface like a pendulum with mass m. So something like this. So we've got a point here. And this whole thing is maybe rotating back and forth, hanging like a pendulum. Then we're look, what we're looking for is the inertia tensor about point P. And we'll start out with knowing what the inertia tensor about point C is, the center of mass. Turns out then that in this case, xc is equal to yc is equal to zc is equal to zero because for the origin of our original coordinate system, this origin is also point okay, also point C, so that forces these to be zero, so we don't have to worry about this this extra big matrix in here that has X C, Y C, and Z C written in many different places in there. It turns out then that the moment of inertia about this particular point P is 7 fifths m r squared uh, for the, about the x and y directions, about this direction and about that direction. But then of course it doesn't change. It's 2 fifths m r squared about the z direction because the new and old axes are, z axes are basically parallel and coincident. Okay. You don't have to confine that to points within the body either. You can actually look at um, points outside the body. You can increase um, this to, say, some external point. Uh, it doesn't have to be within the body at all. So if you're looking at a pendulum, say, um, with, with this large sphere, uh, and, the, and the point of rotation is actually way outside the body, you can treat it entirely different, where, say, cap R is the radius of the sphere, and then R is this distance from the center all the way out to where the pendulum is being hung. Okay. You can also add inertia matrices of parts together to get the total inertial, uh, inertia of the entire system. So this is the inertia matrix. So say this bob, maybe have an inertia matrix of a rod. You can add all that together. You can add and subtract. Maybe you have this bob and then it's hollow. You have that sphere and you subtract out the, the inertia matrix from the center. Okay. So they add and subtract in a Boolean fashion. And this is another example where you can find the inertia matrix for complicated structures. A cylindrical satellite with a magnetometer boom. And this actually is uh, based on a real uh, a spacecraft that had problems. And if you can look up the original Explorer spacecraft uh, back in the 1960s, were sent to Venus and Mars. And they had uh, not magnetometer booms, but they actually had antennas that had small masses on the end of them. Uh, set out like this, and there were three of them or four of them, depending on the year that they were built and the, and the version. And uh, it turns out that these things whip back and forth, and um, it was not only the fact that they, they had the issue I'm about to show you, but it's also because they lost a lot of energy, and it caused, caused the entire structure to tumble and go out of contact. But in any case, back to, any case, back to this problem, if we look at the, the inertia tensor of a, of a cylinder, by itself, we'd actually find that this is what the inertia tensor for that, inertia matrix for that, that system is. And what we're looking for is the inertia matrix of this entire system uh, with the assumed coordinate system that we have here, x, y, and z, and about this point c, and we have another small cylinder of the smaller mass, mass over kcm, the bigger cylinder has a mass uppercase m, and what we need to find is the, the inertia matrix of this entire system. Well, the for the lower, the smaller cylinder, it's similar to the larger cylinders, but it is displaced, so we need the parallel axis theorem there. So we need to translate from point D, the center of 
a center of mass of the smaller cylinder to point C, the center of mass of the larger cylinder. And if we do that, then we actually end up with this product of inertia coupling term, which actually couples um, the rotation of one axis to another axis. And I'll talk to you more about that um, the next time, all right? But uh, in any case, see if you can get this to work out for yourself. Okay? Some other things that you can think about here, that especially with regard to, say, satellites and so forth, you can talk about having uh, uh, structures that actually extend, like the structure we showed here. This is a magnetometer boom. Um, and what happens is, is that you put this in, it looks like a, a can. If you've ever seen these trick cans of uh, like potato chips or something, and when somebody opens them up late at night, a, a, a spring snake jumps out of them. Um, this is a similar sort of deal. The spring thing uncoils and pushes this thing out, and this thing all fits inside a small can inside, canister inside the original satellite um, because you don't want this thing hanging off whenever it's going through the atmosphere because they just get blown off you know, at Mach 5 or whatever the speed of the rocket is as it's launching. So this is an example of one of these types of structures, and it's a lightweight, extendable structure. Um, it's called an astromast. If you look up astromast, you'll find uh, that these have been around for a long time. Um, this is, uh, these have been flown from 17 to 18.5 inches in diameter, and they extend out to 85 feet, or about 30 meters, something like that, to 20 or 30 meters. And uh, they're typically made of glass fiber or uh, carbon fiber, or even the early ones, they were made of, um, of, of metal. And uh, they're really quite uh, inflexible. Um, because if, if they were flexible, then they would cause lots of problems with uh, sensor operation and so forth. Um, as well, we can talk about deployment methods and so forth. This is of, uh, the planning that occurs in, say, solar array deployments. Um, and it talks about the different things. This is actually for a real satellite, as a, uh, the GO satellite. It's a geosynchronous uh, orbit, Earth orbiting satellite for um, um, actually uh, predicting the weather. There's one used to, uh, for Australia, for example, to predict the weather for Australia, as there is for many of the countries in the Northern Hemisphere. And indeed, the way it's launched is it's launched in this state, and everything gets deployed out to where it looks like this. It's a very complicated structure, but this shows you what's possible to, to analyze with the kind of stuff that you're learning in this course, I hope. All right, and then there's also solar sails and booms and so forth that we can talk about. And solar sail is actually used to stabilize this particular spacecraft. Um, there's magnetometer booms and many other types of structures in this particular device. Take a look at this and read through and see what you can see. It's actually kind of uh, educational because it is a real uh, spacecraft and this is the data book for it. So this is the end of this particular lecture. We have one more to go.